tonight, harrowing and traumatizing. Five rescue students of College of Forestry in Kaduna narrate their experience in captivity as they reunite with their families. Prominent Nigerians gather in Abuja to proffer solutions to the prevailing insecurity as concerns of a state of the nation mounts. Vice President Oshibajo challenges Acting Inspector General of Police Usman Al-Khali Baba to restore public trust in the force as he decorates the new police chief. And the EU's medicines regulator links rare blood clots to AstraZeneca vaccine, but it says benefits outweigh side effects. Plus business, sports, news from Abuja, and later from our international studios. On business news tonight, Department of Petroleum Resources revokes four oil mining licenses of Adax Petroleum for assets under development. On sports news tonight, Nigeria Super Eagles move to third position in Africa in the latest the FIFA ranking following an unbeaten streak at the concluded AFCON qualifying series. And from Abuja, judiciary workers vow not to go back to work as the indefinite strike embarked upon by the union enters its second day. After spending about 25 days in the kidnappers' den, the five rescue students of the Federal College of Forestry, Kaduna, today reunited with their families. They're among the 30 students abducted by bandits on March 11th and rescued by troops on Monday, April 5th. The students, who still appear traumatized after their release, also want government to secure the release of their colleagues, 34 of them who are still in the kidnappers' den. The five rescued students of the Federal College of Forestry Mechanization in Kaduna arrived at the state government house accompanied by the State Emergency Management Agency. Twenty-five days gone after the incident, only five of them were freed from their captors, while the fate of the remaining 34 still hangs in the balance. It is an emotional moment for the five of them, as they reunite with their parents one after the other. They could not hold back their tears as they share the harrowing experience of the 25 days spent in the hands of their abductors. Francis and Amina say they are still in shock and unhappy that their colleagues are still out there in the kidnappers' den. It was on the 11th of March, yes, that we were taken from the hostel. So they just came told us to wake up from our sleep, then take us out of the school compound and asked us to lay down on the ground. After laying down on the ground, then they took the school back premises, not knowing the fence was broken already, so they broke the fence with digger and took us out of the hole that they broke themselves. While going out there, that was when we saw majority of them filled with bikes bikes and uh, other things and ammunition. That was what they just got out of from there, from there to another place, from there to another place, from there to another place. We don't even know where we were. Just bush to bush movement. They came around 12 and come and pack us. They take us there. We don't know even the place. I can't even describe it because we used to sleep. We used to sleep on ground without anything to cover our body. For the parents of the freed students, it has been a long wait, but they are happy that at last their children are back alive. I'm not sleepy, and I have BP. I'm not sleeping at all. I've been doing fasting and prayer. With the release of these five students, the state government is reassuring other parents that the remaining 34 students still in captivity will be freed soon, while the state government makes provision for a post-trauma evaluation for them. Upon their retrieval, the governor of Kaduna State, Malam Nasser Ahmed El Rufai, immediately directed the Ministry of Human Services and Social Development and the State Emergency Management Agency 
to offer direct support with the management of the students. Food, clothing, and immediate essentials were provided to the students, and they were housed at a shelter for debriefing. The rescue of the five out of the 39 students abducted renews hope to families of those still in captivity that government and security agencies will step up efforts to secure the release of the remaining 34 students whose fate are yet unknown. More efforts are being put into solving the security problem in the country. The latest is from the National Peace Committee, which is suggesting, among other things, better training for security officers, nationwide implementation of state policing, and a conversation with the Nigerian Guild of Editors to check the spread of misinformation. The suggestions were put forward at the meeting of the committee with traditional rulers, civil society organizations, religious leaders, and security chiefs in Abuja today, with former military head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, as chairman. Our correspondent, Kayla Megwa, reports. The National Peace Committee is meeting with relevant stakeholders as the nation continues to experience escalating cases of insecurity ranging from banditry to kidnappings and regional agitations. The proliferation of caliber of weapons, not only in our sub-region in general, and in Nigeria in particular, is worrying. It is estimated that over six million of such weapons are in circulation in our country. This certainly exacerbated the insecurity and led to over 80,000 deaths. And also, we have close to 3 million internally displaced persons. So, one fundamental issue is the level of unemployment. The discussion moves to relevant stakeholders, including civil society organizations and former military officers. Because in those days, we used to train for something like 18 months, two years. Today, some of these young people are trained for only six months. And I think that is inadequate. There is a sense in which the manner in which the situation we have in our country right now is reported as a way of contributing to trigger off uh, the situation we have. I've had cases where I go to see the governor, he approves that we can give them such stipend at least for their um, abolition of their uniforms and so on. And it is being sent to us through the local government chairman who short circuits it himself. The business community also weighs in on the issue, stating that the cry for more jobs would be a waste of tears if there's no peace in the country. I mean, there's no way for us to continue uh, with this sort of thing while we are underfunding the uh, police, we are underfunding the military. You are also asking them to go and recruit. So when they recruit, why are they going to find the money to pay? This meeting of the National Peace Committee seeks to move the conversation away from who is wrong to what is wrong in the fight against insecurity. The National Peace Committee has also been called upon to speak with editors across the country that with the news being put out there for Nigerians to consume will be one that is aimed towards nation building. Kayla Megwa, Channel Television News. Meanwhile, the federal government has inaugurated the public the Police Public Complaints Committee as a permanent structure that will help to effectively nip in the bud civil unrest and provide an avenue for Nigerians to channel their grievances on misconduct of police officers. The Minister of Police Affairs, Muhammad Dinyadi, says the committee is made up of representatives from the Ministry of Police Affairs, the Police Service Commission, the Ministry of Justice, National Human Rights Commission, National Intelligence Agency, a non-governmental organization, that's Clean Foundation, Nigeria Police Force and Police Community Relations Committee as part as well as Department of State Security Services. 
Now the newly appointed acting inspector general of police, uh, Usman al Khalik Baba, officially resumed duties today as he is decorated with the new rank of inspector general of police by Vice President Professor Yomi Oshibaju. The new IGP, who obviously has his job cut out already, is faced with a task of repositioning the police to regain the trust of Nigerians. This much is what the Vice President has asked him to do as he laments that there are broken bridges of trust between Nigerians and the police. Nigeria's 21st Indigenous Inspector General of Police arrives at the State House ahead of his decoration. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshinbajo, performs the decoration ceremony in the presence of the wife of the new police chief, as well as the outgoing Inspector General of Police, the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa, and the Minister of Police Affairs, Mr. Megarit Ngati. Professor Shinbajo also gave a charge to the new police boss. Under your leadership, the police must now rebuild, in some ways also, the broken bridges of trust with the public and regain the confidence of the citizenry. This is an ongoing challenge, it's an ongoing task that the police force and all of the senior members of the police force must take on as a responsibility. The new IG of police is aware of the task ahead of him and he declares he is prepared to tackle the challenge. I came in at a very challenging time. I know it. I recognize it and I will work on uh, how to improve from where my predecessor has left. At the force headquarters, the number one police officer inspects a guard of honor. <laughs> He proceeds to the conference hall for the traditional handing over of Barton and then he sees off his predecessor. In his maiden address, he promises to ensure that the police is restored as a major force in the country. The task of restoring the primacy of Nigerian police in the internal security architecture of the country is the main challenge ahead of all of us. It is, however, a task that I am convinced we can surmount if we resolve as a people to partner and present a common front against the subversive and criminal elements who are the common enemies of the whole nation. Nevertheless, he has a word of advice for the officers. I am mindful of the yearnings of Nigerians for a policing system that will not only assure them of their safety, but treat them with civility and hold their human rights sacred. As he settles down to business, the task ahead of him is well cut out and is expected to tackle the security challenges ahead of the country. In part two, after the break, we bring you an update on recent attacks on police formations and the military in different parts of the country. 
please join us again. Welcome back. If it has joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Harrowing and traumatizing five rescue students of College of Forestry in Kaduna narrate their experience in captivity as they reunite with their families. Prominent Nigerians gather in Abuja to proffer solutions to prevailing insecurity as concerns of a state of the nation mounts. Vice President Yemi Oshibajo challenges acting Inspector General of Police Usman al Khalibaba to restore public trust in the force as he decorates the new police chief. And the EU's medicines regulator links rare blood clots to AstraZeneca vaccine but insists benefits outweigh side effects. We continue with our stories on security, this time in Bedway State, where the State Security Council today confirmed an attack on soldiers deployed to Konshisha and Oju communities. The two towns inhabiting the Tiv and Igeda tribes have been engaged in a protracted conflict with parties engaged in the services of militia groups to fuel the crisis. After a three-hour meeting at Government House, Makodi, Governor Samuel Otom, told journalists that the attack on soldiers is dangerous and one that should be condemned by any right-thinking person. He also warned the indigence against resorting to hiring militia to settle scores with one another. The report reaching me is that uh, the troops, while they were in Constitution, they were attacked. But the security agencies were able to repair them. And in the course of doing that, two soldiers are missing. So as I talk to you, the operation is still going on. And we hope that those bandits will be apprehended. I want to advise Bemi people, all communities, not just Constitution and religion, that the temptation of going outside to hire militia should be stopped. And there is no reason whatsoever to ambush security men or attack them. Rather, our people should be willing to provide support to our security men wherever they are from, whether they are soldiers, they are police, they are civil defense, they are DSS, we should rather support them because attack on security agencies is attack on the governor, is attack on government, is attack on citizens. Staying in Benway State Government have killed two policemen, escorting some foreigners in Ukum local government area in an ambush at a construction site. One of the foreigners who was also shot dead in the gun battle, beg your pardon, one of the foreigners was shot dead in the gun battle and two others abducted. The Benway State Police Command says more police officers have been deployed to the area with a plan to rescuing the kidnapped victims and apprehending the gunmen. There was a similar attack by gunmen suspected to be bandits in Taraba State where they killed three farmers in Wukiri local government area. The attack happened this morning when the gunmen stormed Asa village through a nearby forest. Residents say five other farmers who escaped the attack were badly injured and are currently receiving treatment at the general hospital. The attack is coming barely 24 hours after two mobile policemen were killed at a checkpoint in Dogungawa community, a suburb of Takum local government area, which is also in the southern zone of Saraba State. The police is yet to confirm the incident. 
We're receiving more information on the attacks by gunmen in Imo State over the past couple of days. The state governor, Hopu Zodema, has blamed the attacks on some political opponents whom he says plan to bring down the APC government. The governor was guest in our political program, Politics Today, where he also gave an update on the number of inmates that are now back to the facility after the jailbreak. As of this afternoon, we have uh, very close to 85 uh, inmates, and we are expecting that more will come. I'm also told that some are calling on phone through their lawyers to be sure that they will not be charged again when they come back. And if this assurance is given to them, that they will willingly come back to the facility. Why police and the security agencies are still uh, fishing identify some and bringing them back to the facility. But what is important here for take home is for Nigerians to know of the plot by a group of aggrieved politicians to destabilize the government of APC. I have done some thorough investigation and I have a credible lead as to those who are sponsoring these activities of these hoodlums. But I can tell you we are working hard to ensure that the sponsors of this dastardly act must be brought to book. Just a quick break from security issues uh, to the Northern Elders Forum, which says the North will not be voting along ethnic or religious lines in the 2023 general elections because it has learned a bitter lesson at a great cost. The decision is part of a communique read at the end of the Northern People's Summit held in Kaduna today. The chairman of the forum, Professor Ango Abdullahi, who spoke through the forum spokesperson, Hakim Baba Ahmed, warns politicians from the region not to expect block votes during the next election, as has been the norm in previous polls. He says the people of the region will vote only for candidates who can take the country out of the brink of collapse, irrespective of the person's tribe or religion. Meanwhile, the governor of Edo State, Gov Governor Godwin Obaseki, has raised alarm over the country's rise in debt profile, saying the situation is more critical now because of the huge amount borrowed to service the ailing economy. Mr. Obaseki said this during a meeting with the transition committee members at Government House Benin City in Edo State. The major oil companies, Shell, Chevron, who are the ones producing, they are no longer investing as much in oil. Chevron is now one of the world's largest investors in alternative fuel. Shell is pulling out of Nigeria. So in another year or so, where will we, where will we find this money that we go to Abuja to share every month? Last month, we got back for March. The federal government printed an additional 50 to 60 billion to top up for us to share. We say remove subsidy. They say no. Next, this April, next week again, we'll go to Abuja, we will share. By the end of this year, total borrowings, the total we have borrowed is going to be in, in excess of 15 to 16 trillion. And my worry is that we wake up one day, like Argentina, the Nara will be 1,000, 2,000, it will be moving. Because we, just, we don't, we don't you, you can imagine a family, you don't have money coming in, you're just borrowing and borrowing and borrowing without any means or idea of how to pay back. Well, the governor believes that politicians planning to buy votes during the 2023 general elections may find it tough this time, as according to him, the Independent National Electoral Commission is properly deploying technology to conduct elections. INEC itself had also begun its own process of change. They have been worried. They were scandalized by what happened in Kogi and by Elsa, and they were trying to redeem themselves. So using technology, they made sure that 
oh, as soon as you finish voting in the polling unit, that result was uploaded straight into a portal so they can see the patterns, which makes it difficult to change results at the collation centers. That is what helped us. So any candidate or any political party that does not see this and expect that we will do business as we used to do before, we'll play politics the way we used to play, we are taking a huge risk. When the news at 10 returns, we'll be heading to Abuja studios to get more on the judiciary workers' strike. Plus, the Department of Petroleum Resources revokes four oil mining licenses of Adax Petroleum for assets under development. Join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10. Time to head on now to the Abuja studios where Gloria Mizuke is standing by with more on the News at 10. Hi, Gloria. Great to see you. Hello, Amarachi. Welcome to Abuja. The Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria is vowing not to go back to work until the demands are met as the indefinite industrial action enters its second day. Across the northern parts of the country, members of the unions ensure full compliance with the industrial action. It's the second day of the industrial action by the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria, and court proceedings at all the courts in Plateau State are on suspension. The situation is the same in Yobe State, as the workers fully complied with the directives of the national body to embark on an indefinite industrial action. The system is collapsing and we are appealing that this system should be fixed because it is a place where a common man comes and get justice. And where there is no justice, in fact that society will be in chaos. And that is our problem. There is a general circular dated on 22nd March that no any state branch or chapter should enter a negotiation or less the national headquarters. From Taraba to Kaduna State, members of the union are resolute about their demands. This is evident as the courts are closed for business. The union is demanding financial autonomy for the judicial arm of government at the federal and state levels, as enshrined in the 1999 constitution. Activities at the state and federal high courts in Kaduna State are also grounded as a result of the industrial action. Some of the litigants who came for the day's proceedings left disappointed. I come to court to do affidavit for my... Uh, I want to re a changing of name. Uh, fortunately, when I came now, they told me that uh, court are on strike. I was not happy concerning it. The chairman of the union in the state reaffirms its commitment not to suspend the strike until the state government grants total autonomy to the judiciary. Every Nigerians know that we have three arms of government, legislative, judi uh, executive, legislature and the judiciary. Judiciary is the only arm of government that sells the arbitration between both the two arms of government. But we are not well financial independence doing our work. And uh, saboteurs of that things, it is the governors of Nigeria. Although the Chief Justice of Nigeria had appealed to the striking workers to go back to work, the level of compliance indicates that the workers are far from retreating. A former president, Goodluck Jonathan, has lauded the achievement of the Bochi state governor, Bala Mohammed, in two years. Dr. Jonathan was in Bochi to commission a 6.2-kilometer road named after him. The former president also appreciates the warm reception he received from the people of Bochi. <laughs> It's the first project to be commissioned since the assumption of Governor Bala Mohammed's administration and the honor is on former President Goodluck Jonathan to do so. He's well received by a crowd of supporters as he moves to perform the assignment. He cuts the tape, unveils the plaque, then takes a drive on the newly constructed 6.2 kilometers road named after him, 
Good luck, Jonathan Drive, as communities cheer on. Governor Bala Mohammed admits that his ability to achieve enviable strides in governance is a lesson learned from the former president. The road provides a vital access to Sabang Aura community that co-hosts the Abu Bakr Taba Apaleo University ATBU campus and equally serves as a bypass linking Josh Road with the Taba Apaleo roads. The road was among the first set of legacy projects in Bakofun within the first 100 days of my administration and it was awarded to Mr. Habibu Engineering Nigeria Limited at the cost of 2.2 billion naira. It was completed within six months, Your Excellency. For Dr. Goodluck Jonathan, it's a privilege to be here and witness firsthand the transformation projects of the governor. So we have a number of projects that I have in this The one that has completed and say that it's here for the people of Bahrain. It's here to serve the people. Let what we want our governors to do. At the palace, the Emir of Bochi confirms that the people are happy with the present leadership of the state. Within two years of his stewardship as the governor, he has justified his election and he is still doing everything possible to justify his victory as the elected governor by executing a lot of projects across the state. The event comes to a climax as former president Jonathan is conferred with the traditional title of Digon Bauchi, which means the backbone of Bauchi. The Bank of Industry is encouraging states to partner with it to advance small and medium skill development across the Federation. Already partnering with 25 states, the BOI is further aiming to expand collaboration with Kebi State, particularly in rice production. The Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of the BOI, Mr. Oluka Dipito, who led senior officials of the bank on a courtesy visit to the Governor of Kebi State, further disclosed that the bank raised $2 billion under the pandemic. Senior officials of the Bank of Industry, led by its Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Oluka Dipito, met with the Kebi State Governor in Abuja. The core mission of the BOI team is to deepen investment in Kebi State. We would like to see a lot of more viable businesses in Kebi, not only Kebi, but all parts of the country. Already, there has been a cordial relationship between the Bank of Industry and Kebi State, as well as a significant investment to the tune of 3.9 billion naira. After the meeting, the Kebi State Governor, Atiku Bagudu, notes that the partnership will advance industrial growth. In Kebi State, we have been very, very lucky that apart from their support for private sector companies that are playing a prominent role in Kebi, they have also partnered with the state government to expand the, uh, the offerings in the uh, in the state we believe they have a lot to offer to us we are promoting uh, entrepreneurship particularly small and medium enterprises in a number of areas particularly processing mining uh, renewable energy and promotion of gender the BOI boss disclosed that operations of the bank was not particularly affected by the pandemic as it raised about $2 billion during the period. He reiterates that the BOI is willing to commit more funding to as many states as possible to boost local businesses. The idea is that any state where the governor is interested in helping the SMEs, you know, uh, we are telling them uh, to put their money down, will match whatever they put down. So Kevin gives us a billion naira, BOI will put a billion naira, which means we are adding, you know, uh, about 50% of the risk. We are taking it. The Bank of Industry partners with Kebi State, among others, with the sole objective of continuing provision of long-term financing to struggling businesses across the country. Well, that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Amara.
Thanks, Gloria. And have a lovely evening. Back here, some members of the management of Channels Television today paid a condolence visit to the family of late Mr. Yinkao Dumaking, the spokesperson of the Pan Yoruba Social Cultural Group, Afeni Ferry, who died on Saturday, April 3rd. His wife, Mrs. Jo Dumaking, company of other family members, received the delegation from Channels Television in their home in Lagos. Channels Television's Assistant General Manager of Operations, Mr. Kingsley Uranta, extended heartfelt condolences to the family on behalf of the organization. The chairman said we must come uh, in his absence. He would have loved to be here. Um, that we must come on his behalf to say sorry. Uh, because we miss um, Mr. Dumaki as a friend of the house for a very long time. He's one person we will call any time and he'll be there um, to, to render service um, to the country. Uh, he, was, he was a fearless man, a man who could speak truth to power. One of the very few people you can depend on to know that white is white and black is black. And for such a person to have left at this very particular time to us is most devastating. But we believe that God knows everything. Sometimes he takes his best earlier than we even imagine. But the fact is the good work he did while he was alive is the legacy he has left behind. I want to thank the management of Channel Television for the outpouring of love, care, and support. I know that uh, Ian Kao will be very proud. I call him Cambridge. Cambridge will be very proud of the management of Channels wherever he is. Ian Kao was uh, so selfless committed on assuming at any point in time, if it has to do with the media, if it has to do with Nigerian project, if it has to do with the nationality question, if it has to do with uh, the Yoruba race, he will be at the forefront. Even at the time when doctors said his oxygen was running low, he was still reaching out for his iPad to type the article meant for his column. We do send our condolences also from here. And now to business news. Here's Anne Mamodo. Well, our thoughts and prayers are with your Dumaki's family. Welcome to business news. Let's begin with the Department of Petroleum Resources saying that it has revoked four oil mining licenses belonging to Adax Petroleum due to non-development of assets by the petroleum company. The statement by the regulatory agency today says the affected assets are OML 123, 124, 126 and 137 as they have remained underdeveloped leading to loss of revenue to the federal government. Government. The statement, which quotes the DPR's director, Mr. Sarki Awalu, saying the licenses have been reawarded to Kaztec Engineering Limited and Salvic Petroleum Resources Limited. He explains that the OML 122 and 124 are to expire by 2022, while OML 126 and 137 will expire in 2024 and 2027, respectively. The president of Dangote Group, Aliko Dangote, has again emerged top on the list of African billionaires that have made the 2021 Forbes World Billionaires List with a net worth of $11.5 billion from $8.3 billion recorded in 2020. Other Nigerians on that list include the chairman of Globacom, Mr. Mike Adenuga, who ranked fifth in Africa with a net worth of $6.1 billion from $5.6 billion last year. The founder of Bois group, Abdul Samad Rabiu, also made the list as number six in Africa with a net worth of $4.9 billion from $2.9 billion in 2020. According to the Forbes 2021 World's Billionaires List, the combined net worth of the three richest Nigerians increased by $5.7 billion in one year to $22.5 billion. In all, 14 African billionaires made the list this year, including five South Africans, five Egyptians, and one Algerian. 
Ministers and governors under the group of 20 have agreed on the final extension of the debt service suspension initiative by six months until the end of December 2021. The DSSI, which took effect on May the 1st, 2020, was expected and extended to June 2021 and has now delivered about $5 billion in relief to more than 40 eligible countries. A communique issued after the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors also called on the IMF to make a proposal for a new special drawing rights general allocation worth $650 billion to meet the long-term global need to supplement reserve assets. The G20 ministers and governors are scheduled to hold the third meeting on July the 9th to the 10th in Venice. In the meantime, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, has warned developing countries that the various intervention funds received to cushion the effects of COVID-19 have their consequences. According to the Director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department at the IMF, Tobias Adrian, extraordinary policy measures have eased financial conditions and helped to contain financial stability risks, but those rescue efforts may have unintended consequences and sow the seeds of future financial market instability. He says addressing corporate sector weaknesses and repairing balance sheets is priority and emerging markets should rebuild buffers to prepare for a potential repricing of risk and a reversal of capital flows. The Debt Management Office has now released a 2021 second quarter auction dates for the issuance of federal government bonds. A statement by the DMO states that between 150 to 180 billion naira will be issued monthly with the, the quarter in review. It also states that FGN bonds being issued are all reopenings with tenors of maturity at approximately 6, 14 and 24 years. The DMO had earlier announced the offering for subscription of two and three years FGN savings bond for the month of April, which opened on Tuesday, April the 6th, until Friday, April the 9th. Let's head to the domestic stock market now. It has started trading marginally. It came out positive today, defying expectations of continued bearish trend. Investors raking a mild four billion naira gain today. Ekaite Afia has the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. I'm Akaite Afia. Well, as you can see, the bull finally showed up in the market today since its last appearance four trading sessions ago. However, today's gains were marginal as the All Share Index rose by two basis points. Volume, value, and deals traded today were much higher when compared to Tuesday's session as over 356 million units changed hands in 6,130 deals. Now, today's gains were largely driven by the 1.12% increase in MTN Nigeria and the almost 2% increase on the consumer goods sector. All other counters that we track closed negative. Now, the trio of Zenith Bank, Access Bank, and Transcorp were the most traded for the day. As the second quarter kicks in, investors are expected to rebalance their portfolios based on assessments of corporate earnings released during the first quarter while keeping an eye on the movement of yields in the fixed income market. Thanks for joining us for the Stock Market Report. I'm Akaite Afia. Back to you. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Umawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues with Amarachi. Thanks a lot, Anne. The UK Metropolitan Police have confirmed that a body found in a pond in Essex is that of missing London student Richard Okoroge, whose parents are of Nigerian descent. The body, which was found on Monday evening, was later identified as that of Richard, who had not been seen by his family since March 22nd, when he left home in Ladbroke Grove. Police say a post-mortem found no evidence of physical trauma or assault on the body, while the cause of death is still pending, as further investigations are being carried out. The head of the Met Central West Public Protections Unit, Detective Superintendent Danny Goslin, says the police will ensure that his grieving family is well supported by specially trained officers.
Meanwhile, the European Medicines Agency has confirmed a link between the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine and rare blood clots. It's just authorities in the UK advise that people under age 30 should take alternative vaccines. Head of the agency, Emma Cook, says a particular combination of unusual blood clots with low blood platelet counts should be listed as a side effect of the vaccine. Stopping short of recommending its use to be limited, but adding that the benefits of the shot outweigh the risks. Simon Pusey has more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Australia has said that it will ask the European Union to release more than 3 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, testing Brussels' claim that it is not blocking shipments. The contracted vaccines that we had been relying upon in early January when we'd set out a series of targets did not turn up in Australia. Australia has so far fallen 85% sure of its first big deadline to deliver 4 million doses by March and Prime Minister Scott Morrison has blamed the delay on the European Union's block of some AstraZeneca vaccine shipments. The EU has denied issuing an export ban on vaccines. Brazil has recorded more than 4,000 COVID-related deaths in just 24 hours for the first time as a more contagious variant fuels a surge in cases. Hospitals are overcrowded with people dying as they wait for treatment in some cities and the health system is on the brink of collapse in many areas. The country's death toll is now almost 337,000, second only to the US. Human rights group Amnesty International has said that Alexei Navalny is imprisoned in conditions that amount to torture and may slowly be killing him. The fact that he is woken up every one or two hours is a form of torture. The prominent opponent of Russian President Vladimir Putin is being subjected to sleep deprivation and does not have access to a doctor he can trust in jail. Navalny went on hunger strike last week in an attempt to force the prison to provide him with proper medical care. The Kremlin has declined to comment on his health. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has said the country is facing its worst ever situation and called on members of the ruling Workers' Party to be more proactive in carrying out the country's new economic plan. Kim made the comments during an opening speech at a meeting of the party's cell secretaries. He urged the grassroots members to carry out the decisions made at a party congress in January, where he announced a new five-year plan and said for the first time that his efforts to improve the economy were not succeeding. Two United Nations agencies has said that about a third of the entire population of the Democratic Republic of Congo is facing acute hunger. The World Food Programme and the Food and Agriculture Organization said that more than 27 million Congolese are urgently in need of food. Conflict is a key cause of hunger, especially in the eastern provinces, where dozens of rebel groups carry out frequent deadly attacks. Twelve crew members of a Dutch cargo ship have been rescued in stormy weather off the coast of Norway. The ship made a distress call reporting a heavy list after the rough weather displaced some of its cargo. The first eight members were airlifted by helicopter from the deck of the cargo ship, but the last four had to jump into the water because the waves were rocking the boat and the list was too severe. Thai rescue workers have freed a Buddhist monk from a flooded cave four days after he went inside to meditate. The monk, who was on a pilgrimage, entered the cave to sit in contemplation on Saturday. But an unseasonal rainstorm struck the area, causing water levels to rise and flood the cave. When he did not return, residents alerted authorities. A team of 17 divers participated in the effort to find and then free the monk. Harry and Meghan, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, have announced their first Netflix project after signing a production deal last year. The series will focus on athletes competing in the Invictus Games for injured veterans in The Hague in 2022. Netflix said that Harry will appear on camera in the show called Heart of Invictus and serve as an executive producer throughout the couple's Archwell productions. The Invictus Games is a multi-sport event created in 2017 by Prince Harry for military personnel wounded in action. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. The local organising committee for the 20th edition of the National Sports Festival has announced that it is shutting down the competition. The community co coordinator for media and publicity, Musa Ebohmiana, told Channel's television that the federal government is yet to release funds as promised. 
He says the shutdown order will take effect from 12 noon tomorrow if the funds are not available. Nitro Super Eagles have moved to the third position in Africa in the latest ranking released today by the World Football Governing Body, FIFA. This comes on the back of an unbeaten streak at the qualifying series for next year's African Nations Cup, where the three-time African champions finished top of their group to book a place at the tournament in Cameroon. Senegal is Africa's number one, closely followed by Tunisia. In the UEFA Champions League, Kylian Mbappe scored twice as PSG produced a superb away performance to beat title holders Bayern Munich in the thrilling quarterfinal first leg played at the Allianz Arena. Mason Mount and Ben Chiwell netted for the first time in the competition to give the Blues Chelsea two vital away goals and a 2-0 win over FC Porto in Seville. The return legs hold next week. And Manchester City Football Club midfielder Kevin De Bruyne has signed a two-year contract extension that will keep him at the football club until 2025. The Belgium international, whose existing deal was due to expire in 2023, will see, will see out most of the remainder of his contract at the 80 hat. And that's wrap and Sports News is back to your march. Thanks, Ayat Sunde. And the main news again. The five rescue students of the College of Forestry Kaduna today narrated their harrowing and traumatizing experience in captivity as they reunited with their families. They also asked the government to rescue their colleagues. 34 of them were still in captivity. And that's the news of 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Amarachi. Thank you.